Just a reminder to all panelists to mute your microphones. Good morning. I'm Kent TC, Idea Ag Farm Fest Forum Coordinator and Vice President at MinStar Bank. And I'm pleased to be helping to MC today's virtual town hall on trade, supply chains, and the future of American agriculture. Minnesota Farm Fest is proud to be hosting this town hall with Ag Talks and with Minnesota AgriGrowth. We have a great lineup of panelists and a wonderful moderator. But before we get to that, I wanna say a few words about FarmFest and then play a short Ag Talks video. The pictures you're seeing on your screen right now are from past FarmFests. And whether it's a pancake breakfast or the trade show, or one of the best things about FarmFest is the chance to see each other in person and have a chance to talk. In the midst of a global pandemic, we all know that it's not possible to be, meet in person. And that's why FarmFest has gone virtual this year. We're striving to bring you the same great conversations to you, even though we can't be together. Hopefully each of you has made a big plate of pancakes to enjoy at home. And I hope you're able to enjoy this program from the comfort of your kitchen or living room. We're going to start with a short introductory video and then I will introduce Tamara Nelson with Minnesota AgriGrowth. in the hog industry, which what I do is uh, about 13th nationally in exporting pork. We've seen a decline of markets uh, based on the tariffs. It's been really difficult for us to be able to move product and then to be able to at least get a market that, uh, that pays us for our product. At the current prices, uh, we cannot be profitable planting soybeans next year. And it's not just soybeans, it's, it's, it's all the trade. Uh, and, you know, these tariffs are not just hitting farmers, they're hitting manufacturers. You know, I sat on that round table, there was aluminum guys and steel guys and equipment guys, and it's just having a, a crushing, rippling effect. When there's uncertainty about the markets for a product, it tends to back up into areas and the prices decline. The market risk that's present today is, uh, is creating a lot of problems, a lot of price problems for farmers, and it's very difficult to plan for that. The uncertainty on our market is a huge concern to us. It, it affects our business. We don't exactly know <coughs> what we should plant. Are we going to have a market for it? Is there going to be demand for our product? Thank you, that's a great framing for today's discussion. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Tamara Nelson, Executive Director of Minnesota AgriGrowth. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Kent. Minnesota AgriGrowth is pleased to be partnering with Minnesota Farm Fest and Ag Talks on this town hall. Today's event is part of a national conversation called Ag Talks, coordinated by Farmers for Free Trade. Egg Talks is sponsored by America's leading organizations and businesses, including North National Corn Growers, National Milk, U.S. Dairy Export, Farmers for Free Trade, Corn Refiners, Plant-Based Products Council, Heyco ISOM, World Strategies, Fresh Produce Association of the Americas, American Farm Bureau, and the National Association of State Departments of Agriculture. Egg Talks is a national conversation focusing on trade, supply chains, and the future of American agriculture. This conversation is critically important, especially now. In recent years, we've seen significant disruptions to agricultural trade with tariffs and retaliatory tariffs, 
decreasing exports, depressed commodity prices, and increasing costs for some, pro some farm inputs. At the same time, we've seen some glimmers of hope with the recently implemented US-Mexico-Canada agreement and other bilateral efforts. Ag Talks is an effort to focus forward in a constructive, non-political fashion. Regardless of who wins the 2020 election, what does the agricultural community want to see next from the White House, from Congress? What policies can Congress and the White House adopt that will help boost exports and get U.S. agriculture back on a solid footing? Today's virtual town hall is the second in a series of five town halls that Ag Talks will convene this summer across the Midwest. The first town hall was held last week in Iowa and was a great success. After today's town hall, Ag Talks will hold events in Michigan, August 13th, Pennsylvania, August 27th, and Wisconsin on September 1st. You can learn more or sign up at www.agtalks.net. So just a few housekeeping items. First, this program is on the record. Second, the session will be recorded and will be available after today's session. Third, we will open the session to audience questions and welcome you to send those in via the question button at the bottom of your screen. Angela Hoffman with Farmers for Free Trade is with us today and will be reviewing submitted questions and queuing them up for the panel. If you are media, please indicate so when you send in your questions so that we can get to your questions as quickly as possible. During the Q&A portion, we will also administer two polls using the Zoom platform. When you see those polling questions pop up, please respond to them. We will share the results of the poll at the end of the town hall. Most importantly to our panelists, we ask you to kindly mute your microphone when you're not speaking. So let's get started. It is my great pleasure to introduce as today's panel moderator, a longtime agricultural leader, Dr. Barb Glenn. CEO of the National Association of State Departments of Agriculture. NASDA is a nonpartisan nonprofit association that represents the elected and appointed commissioners, secretaries, and directors of the Department of Agriculture in all 50 states and four U.S. territory. These include Tom Peterson, our own commissioner of agriculture in Minnesota. Dr. Glenn is a scientist with decades of experience as a researcher, policy leader, and advocate for agriculture. She previously held leadership positions with Crop Life America and the Biotechnology Innovation Organization in Washington, DC. Earlier in her career, she led governmental affairs for the Federation of Animal Science Societies, conducted dairy cattle research for USDA's ARS, and was the first woman to serve as president of the American Society of Animal Science. Dr. Glenn holds a BS in animal science and a PhD in ruminant nutrition from the University of Kentucky. Barb, thank you so much for all you've done for our industry and for helping to moderate today's virtual hall with FarmFest, Ag Talks, and Minnesota Agri-Growth. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Kent and Tamara, and thanks to Minnesota FarmFest and Minnesota Agri-Growth for hosting Ag Talks Town Hall today. Good morning, everybody. We have a great lineup today, and I would like to now briefly introduce each of our panelists. So first we have John Griffith, who is Senior Vice President of Global Grain Marketing and CHS Hedging. John is responsible for all CHS global commodity and renewable fuels trading, supply chain management, and risk management, including freight, currency, execution, and trade finance. He also oversees CHS Hedging LLC, a commodities brokerage subsidiary of CHS Incorporated. John grew up on a corn, soybean, and livestock farm in southwestern Minnesota, and during his high school years, he worked part-time at a local grain elevator. Next, we have, we're joined by Cheryl Meschke. Cheryl is CEO and co-president of Association Milk Producers Incorporated. Cheryl serves on the boards of the U.S. Dairy Export Council, Minnesota Agrigrowth, the Innovation Center for U.S. Dairy, and is chairman of the board for Minnesota Dairy Research, Teaching, and Consumer Education Authority. We're also joined today by Howard Olson. Howard is Senior Vice President of Government and Public Affairs for Ag Country Farm Credit Services. 
Howard is responsible for developing and implementing Ag Country's local, state, and federal legislative strategy. He also represents Ag Country in the public arena before elected officials, academic, government, and other audiences. Next, we're pleased to be joined by Becca Martin, who serves as Director of Government Affairs for Cargill. Becca has worked for Cargill for over 13 years, serving in numerous roles, including as Economic Development Director and as Biofuels Analyst. Becca has worked for the Minnesota State Senate and has her BS in Economics from the University of Minnesota, Duluth. Next, we're joined by Harold Woolley. Harold is a board member for the National Corn Growers Association. He serves as a member of the Corn Board of the National Corn Growers Association. On the national level, Harold also serves as the board liaison to the Risk Management Transportation Action Team on NCGA's Finance Committee, as the board appointment to the Corn PAC, and as the 2020 liaison to the National Coalition for Food and Agriculture Research. On the state level, Harold is a past president of Minnesota Corn Growers Association and past chairman of the Watanwan Farm Service Central Farm Service Co-op Board, as well as the Con Plus Co-op Board. And finally, our co-host, Tamara Nelson, is also joining us today and will serve as a panelist. Prior to joining Minnesota AgriGrowth as Executive Director, Tamara served as Senior Director of Commodities and Affiliate Management for the Illinois Farm Bureau. Tamara also has served as Senior Consultant in Agri-Food Marketing in Washington, D.C., and as Assistant Executive Director, International Policy Council on Agriculture, Food, and Trade. So with that, we have an amazing group of panelists, and I'm going to now uh, give them time to make a short opening statement. So we're going to start off first with John Griffith. Thank you, Barb, and good morning, everyone, and, and thanks for having me today. Um, CHS is the nation's largest cooperatives, touching nearly 700,000 producers across the country, either indirectly or directly through our own uh, system. The purpose of the company is creating connections to empower agriculture. We use a network of over 900 employees around the globe at 14 different offices to achieve that goal and connect um, the commodity supply chains globally. We support and promote free trade and fair trade, and we desire market access to support our owners. I think the goal of any commodity-based supply chain is to have predictability and consistency. Global commodities have enough volatility without the introduction uh, of politically driven actions that create distortion in trade flows. Clear and predictable market access is more important yet than ever um, because frankly, it's more difficult than ever right now. Um, you know, the supply chains make uh, very long-term decisions. Those decisions could be in the generations of family farms and handing down that, those farms for generations and the investments that go into um, having an effective uh, farming operation in rural communities, the billions of dollars invested in transportation infrastructures, handling assets, uh, to distribute and collect both on and off the farm, and value-added processing uh, assets that support employment in communities and, and rely on market access to be successful. The risk of all of these investments uh, has increased, as I said, with the, with the unpredictability that we have been experiencing. I'm really happy to see progress, um, you know, particularly with USMCA uh, positions us in, in good trade relations with our neighbors um, for a long time to come. Uh, Japan phase one uh, shores up some gaps left by the exiting of the TPP and, and keeps US grain competitive into that marketplace. And we're seeing good progress on China phase one. Um, and that's been you know, a recent development and it's been uh, pretty exciting uh, purchases of corn, soybeans. Uh, and wheat have definitely accelerated. Um, still a lot of work to do to achieve those uh, targets, um, but you know, there's good progress. We also have the, the unpredictability of COVID-19. Um, and as a critical business, we have most of our, our company and our industry uh, still in the workplace and working on the front lines. Um, the deployment of human capital varies in intensity across the supply chains and the goal of keeping those employees safe has remained a constant challenge. 
Um, there's this evidence of further disruption and unanticipated variation ripples through the entire supply chain from farm to fork. So far, companies like CHS continue to see a path forward despite the significant supply chain market disruptions. However, we hope that the seriousness of the pandemic and the intensity of the global political disagreements subside soon so that we can all focus on long-term free and fair trade practices that increase access for farmers in Minnesota and elsewhere across our country. So thank you for the opportunity to make my opening remarks, Barb, and I'll turn it back to you. Thank you so much, John. Uh, let's turn now to Cheryl for her opening remarks. Cheryl? And Cheryl, we currently have you on mute. So I can you I, hear me now? Yeah. Oh, now I hear you, Cheryl. Okay, thank you. We'll try this again. <laughs> Go uh, for it. The, the, sh the shock waves that COVID 19 sent through the food supply chain are well documented, and each sector's story is uniquely complicated. We're going to hear that today. In my opening comments, I'm going to make a sincere effort to simplify the pandemic's impact on the U.S. dairy industry and uh, namely the dominant cheese category. Uh, I'll then share some longer term thoughts about how this pandemic might change how we view the food chain. Everything from farmers to those who haul, make and package our food and those who buy our food here and abroad. So as I, I begin this assessment, I think it's important to uh, share uh, my perspective. So what's the glass that I'm looking through? I've worked for dairy farmers for 30 years. Uh, the dairy farmers who own a cooperative, AMPI, and they operate dairy farms throughout the upper Midwest, but as important, they collectively own eight dairy manufacturing plants in that same geographic area. That's significant because those plants and employees serve both the retail and food service markets that we're hearing so much about in this pandemic. Collectively, those dairy farmers sell about $2 billion of dairy products, and that includes 10% of the country's butter, 10% of American cheese and cheddar, and 10% of slices that uh, are processed cheese, thanks those that go on hamburgers. But every day, we are focused on improving farm milk prices, dairy markets, and how much cheese and butter you're eating. So again, that's the perspective. So with that, let's break down the pandemic's impact. Uh, every month, the U.S. is making about a billion pounds of cheese. So think one billion. Of that, pre-pandemic, about 400 million was going to food service, 400 million to retail, and the balance was going for food ingredients and, and export. When the pandemic hit, the food service demand disappeared. That's 400 million pounds of cheese every single month. Consumers wanted it, but we just didn't have a way to deliver it. Here's a, a very practical illustration of the difficulty when shifting from food service to retail. In one of our packaging plants, for instance, we have a, a line that does five pound bags of shredded cheese for restaurants. That can't be quickly retooled to produce eight ounce bags for grocery store shelves. So let's go the next step. You've got uh, Joe and Jane Shopper buying eight ounce uh, bags of shredded cheese because their favorite restaurant is closed. The result is empty store shelves, indicative of supply chain issues, not shortages. That supply chain backup drove cheese markets to the lowest level since the CME open dairy trading about 20 years ago. But now, months into this pandemic, let's turn from the rear view mirror to the windshield. Uh, I think that longer term, this pandemic is unmasking weaknesses in the food supply chain. And I really want to emphasize that. It's unmasking weaknesses in the food supply chain. If our food supply is a pillar of national security, we need to focus on critical questions. Allow me to pose two. Do farmers have a secure market? And are we providing food security for this country and beyond our borders? 
those all-American questions addressing both ends of the food chain are critical. And let me ask just a few more. How can we better coordinate bringing products from farm to plant? How do we provide a safe workplace? How do we put flexibility in our supply chain? And where do we deploy that all-important capital to do just that? I'll bet on the U.S. farmer and every link in our food supply chain to address those questions. We'll continue to feed the U.S. and the world with the most safe, sustainable, and affordable food supply. I look forward to this morning's conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cheryl. And now we'll turn to Howard for opening remarks. Thank you. We were asked to provide input on the current state of agriculture in America and, and explore ideas for enhancing the global competitiveness of American egg in the context of market expansion and other trade. Egg Country Farm Credit provides credit and financial services to farmers across Minnesota, North Dakota, and Wisconsin. So I want to try and provide some information on the impact of trade at the farm gate level. You know, what's happening on rural route one. If we go to that first slide. I think we all know that the trade war and Chinese tariffs were hard on commodity prices in our farms. Pre-trade war, most of the northern Minnesota and North Dakota soybeans were shipped to China. And to illustrate the impact locally, this is a chart of the basis uh, for soybeans at an elevator in Polk County, Minnesota. This is the East Grand Forks, Crookston, Foston area. You can see right uh, in the first part of the chart, around July 1st, 2018, uh, and the drop in that basis from uh, about a 96 under basis down to $1.38 under and eventually to $1.49 under. This is when the tariffs with the Chinese um, came into place and, uh, and the trade war hit us. The, the futures price had dropped about a dollar and a half in that time period, but the basis price also dropped by um, about another uh, almost a dollar um, overall, well, a good 50, 60 cents during that time period. So it really indicates and illustrates the heavy reliance that we have on Chinese trade, probably too much reliance. The cash price for the farmer during this time uh, dropped from um, 9.47 down to about $7.53 a bushel, about a $2 drop, about a 20% drop in price. So very significant and perhaps too much uh, reliance on the Chinese trade. Ethanol is also subject to world problems. We locked down the country and then have Russia start an oil price war with the Saudis and we see what happened to ethanol demand and production. The next slide, please. This is the uh, ethanol production chart. And you can see as soon as we locked down the country due to the, due to the coronavirus and at the same time, Russia started that oil price war with the, with the Saudis, our demand for ethanol dropped dramat dramatically and the uh, plants had to reduce production. Some went into a hot idle and some shut down. This hurts the corn farmers who have contracted corn with those ethanol plants to deliver. Now let's bring this to the farm level in the farm economy and farm finances. The next slide, please. At Egg Country, uh, we rate every borrower's credit risk. We use a term called probability of default or PD. This is a trend chart of our average uh, PD since 2005, and it shows the deterioration the smaller the number on this chart, the better is that probability default and the better the credit risk. You can see um, that it dropped, the, the, the probability default was at its best in 2013. And then the numbers start to increase from there showing a deterioration in the credit and the credit risk. From 2016 to today, the last third of that chart, uh, we've had difficult to no cash flows. There's been a struggle to maintain debt services and working capital. And, um, and especially after the Chinese trade issues. Big yields and outproducing help, but otherwise well, we're becoming more dependent on government payments and these PDs are continuing to grind higher. Um, the farm financial problems are increasing while, and, and while the statistics, this is still okay from a macro perspective, it doesn't tell the true story of what's happening on um, many individual farms across Minnesota. We have benchmark data that shows the 2019 net farm income of corn and soybean growers averaged $63,000 in 2019. Now that was net farm income before family living and taxes were, were taken out. However, the top 25% of the producers in the benchmark averaged $321,000. So if we've got the top 25% at 321 and the overall average at 63,000, 
that means there's a lot of farmers that had negative earnings in 2019. And what will 2020 bring? We'll wait and we'll find out this fall and through the winter. So let me just wrap up by saying the most important development in trade in the last three years for farmers in the Northern Plains is a loss of that Chinese soybean market. Unfortunately, this important development is a negative um, development in trade. We can't rely solely on trade and exports, and we need to continue to expand demand in our country. With that, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Howard. That was great. And now we'll turn to Becca. Well, thank you, Barb. Um, I'm excited to be part of this important virtual discussion this morning. So, Car is 155 years old. We're still privately held and family owned. We specialize in food processing, food ingredients, beef and poultry production, animal feed, and commodity trading. We employ 160,000 people across 70 countries, but our products reach customers in 125 countries. We have deep roots here in Minnesota, where we operate 17 facilities, including our global headquarters, and we employ nearly 5,000 people here. So I thought this morning I would provide a bit of a global, global COVID trade perspective um, and then a little bit about how we are kind of refocusing our efforts as a result. So flashback to the beginning of 2020 and I think things were looking relatively positive from a trade standpoint with the anticipated passage of USMCA and the phase one agreement with China and then COVID happened. So I think prior to COVID, deglobalization was a word I'd only heard a few times. And I think now, unfortunately, it's, it's our reality. Um, COVID has prompted new levels of protectionist rhetoric in many countries. So we're seeing kind of driving of a lessons learned message that regions need to be more self-sufficient and depend less on outside resources and improve their own food security. At the same time, COVID is furthering efforts that were already underway to address socioeconomic issues such as climate change and environmental sustainability. So we are now seeing that governments are linking the cause of COVID to land use change and biodiversity destruction, fueling the notion that protecting and restoring the climate will help prevent future infectious diseases. These government efforts to address sustainability and deforestation are inextricably linked to trade and to protecting local markets, creating shorter supply chains to be less dependent on, on imported products. So this is a critical time for Cargill in our journey and, and clearly in our history. Amidst a pandemic, farmers are trying to adjust. The food production sector is changing, but the expectations of our consumers are also still changing. So we know that what served us well yesterday is probably not gonna work for us tomorrow. But we do know that ag is how we will continue to feed the world in a safe, responsible, and sustainable way. So our main focus is now on how we serve our farmer customer. Um, and we're seeing them facing multiple challenges today, challenging farm economics in many areas, commodity price pressure, cost pressure, clearly geopolitical issues affecting their markets and the demand, the trade wars, the tariffs, challenging seasonal conditions. You've got drought in some areas of the country and you've got flooding in other parts over recent years, but other substantial challenges such as um, efficient infrastructure, rural access to broadband, access to labor. Um, as Cargill, because we are so diverse, we feel we can help farmers navigate these challenges in a variety of ways to be more sustainably profitable. We wanna provide efficient access to diverse markets via the markets that we still have via our ability to manage new supply chains. Um, we want to provide our farmer customers with risk management tools and solutions that help them manage price risk as part of their marketing plan. Um, provide opportunities and premiums in those new markets because of consumer changing uh, demands and taste preferences. So GM, non-GM, organic, um, via our specialty supply chains but also build practical opportunities for farmers to be seen as part of the solution to sustainability challenges, uh, soil health, carbon, water, and not the perceived problem. Um, so driving a different narrative. The, it's clear the food supply chain has experienced major disruption since the pandemic, but we've also seen that the food system is resilient um, in large part to the dedication of our essential workers. People's lives depend on our ability to manage crises and adapt to changing market conditions. And it's truly Cargill's fundamental belief that food should be considered a basic human right. 
and should flow freely across the border. So this is why we continue to be strongly focused on eliminating trade barriers and explore every opportunity for our farmers. So thank you, Barb, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, Becca, thanks so much. Great comments. So now we'll turn to Harold. Good morning. My son Matthew and I raise corn and soybeans in near St. James, Minnesota. I serve as a director for both the Minnesota Corn Growers Association and the National Corn Growers Association, and I'm a delegate to the U.S. Grains Council. I'm happy to be here with you today to discuss the future of agriculture and our global competitiveness. In the corn industry, we've been focused on building demand for corn, especially through a few difficult years in agriculture. In 2018, I told my son, don't worry, next year will be better. Well, then came 2019 with its uh, trade wars and horrible weather, and now 2020 with a coronavirus pandemic. Analysis that NCGA commissioned from the University of Illinois shows that corn farmers faced immediate price loss from COVID-19 on the 2019 corn crop. Demand destruction in the ethanol and livestock sectors is anticipated to have a dramatic impact on the 2020 corn crop as well. It's been a perfect storm for our corn industry and now we're all working on staging our comeback. One area that's near and dear to my heart is the ethanol industry, which is a market that takes more than 35% of our corn annually. On a cold winter day, I can see the plumes of steam from three different ethanol plants from my farmyard, and I have six ethanol plants within a 50 mile radius. So it's a tremendous market for Southern Minnesota. NCGA is also working hard to support the industry ethanol industry's recovery and long-term success. To advance ethanol's long-term strategic positioning, NCGA is promoting legislation that would establish a low carbon octane standard. This legislation would remove barriers to higher blends of ethanol, improve vehicle efficiency and increase engine performance, reduce carbon emissions, make energy more affordable for all consumers. In terms of global competitiveness, the expansion of ethanol exports is an opportunity to really move the demand needle for our industry. The global ethanol market has grown from more than 4.5 billion gallons in 2000 to more than 29 billion gallons in 2019. Global customers are increasingly turning to ethanol not only as an affordable source of renewable energy, but one that delivers superior environmental and human health benefits over other sources of energy. Many countries are looking to improve air quality and reduce carbon emissions, and ethanol can help them achieve their environmental goals. A 2018 USDA life cycle analysis shows corn-based ethanol currently results in between 39 and 43% lower greenhouse gas emissions than gasoline. In 2018-19 marketing year, U.S. exported 1.55 billion gallons of ethanol to 68 countries, which was a slight decrease from the previous record year. As U.S. corn-based ethanol becomes more commonplace in global markets, we have seen significant tariff and non-tariff barriers to trade. China, Brazil, Mexico, India, and Southeast Asia are all significant markets for our ethanol. There are many things NCGA and our partners are working on to build demand and make the corn industry more competitive. I hope you will take two things from our remarks today. Ethanol exports have tremendous potential to move the needle for U.S. corn and ethanol industries. And when trade works, the world wins. Thank you. Very well said, Harold. Thank you so much. Okay, now last but not least, uh, Tamara, your remarks, please. Thank you, Barb. Well, thank you, everyone. And um, as someone who's worked in uh, international trade and agriculture and food markets for many, many years, I can certainly attest to the fact that the last several years have been a roller coaster. Um, AgriGrowth uh, is a not-for-profit, nonpartisan membership organization that includes everyone from the farmer to the Fortune 500. So I. I feel that our members feel the successes and the pain of um, alterations in market and uh, changes to the food supply system, as well as anyone, if not more. 
Um, I appreciated very much uh, Becca's comments because I do feel like this sector is always innovating from the farmer all the way to the Fortune 500 and in between. Everyone is constantly working to be better, to be more resilient, to adapt to the environment that we have to deal with and generally to remain optimistic. It's been difficult to remain optimistic in recent years, particularly with the challenges uh, on trade and tariffs. So many of us, individual farmers, uh, ag professionals, ag companies have worked for 30 or more years, whether it was in the Uruguay round of the GATT or the original NAFTA negotiations, or perhaps even uh, CAFTA, the Canada-US, or CUSTA, the Canada-US trade agreement many, many years ago. We've been working for decades to open markets overseas. And so we want to see the markets get back to normal as much as we can. And we want to have that access. And, and Becca's comments about the importance of having the efficiencies to be able to have the products get where they need to so that people can be fed and also to provide those opportunities in other countries where they can also produce and market their own products within the parameters also of concerns about climate, weather variation, or just good practices. I'm very proud to be a part of this panel today, particularly since all of the organizations involved are members of ours and we are always very proud of them and the efforts they undertake. I think it's important as we move forward that we do take time to step back since we have lots of time at home to think, to think about what do we want our policy to look like in the future, whether on trade or on farm programs or on uh, size and efficiency issues. I know that as a part of agriculture that folks will work very hard to do the right thing and to get the right policies. And it's not a time for another gut punch of, of poorly thought out policies or regulations against agriculture or agri-food. We did a masterful job of responding to COVID-19. There were very few and limited disruptions considering how effective and efficient our food chain is and considering the weather and market and other challenges faced by our farmers. So I encourage you all to think broadly, think progressively, what does this sector need to look like in the next 20 years? And I thank you for your time. All right, Tamara, thank you so much. A great challenge to everyone that's with us today. So with that, I am going to now tee up a first question for every panelist to respond to. For some of you, this may ground you've already discussed, but let's start here anyways this morning. Please tell us where we are today with trade in your industry. What have been the most significant developments in recent years? Is your industry struggling or doing well in terms of trade and exports? So it may sound like an easy question, but let's get through it here. John, I'll start with you. All right, great. Thanks, Barb. Yeah, I think uh, we've we've covered some of this ground already, but I'll I'll just highlight some key points. Um, in the last few years, uh, we've had a strong global production of grains, um, and we've not had any significant supply shocks or any significant demand shocks. So there's been adequate supply that's put pressure on prices. Um, on top of that, of course, which has been well established is the trade war um, and the more protectionist environment that we found ourselves in. Um, and that has made you know, significant disruptions uh, in the pricing and, and the revenue capabilities of many of the farms as, as Howard showed us in, in his charts already this morning. So you know, those things have had a, just a, a tremendous impact on production agriculture and the entire supply chain globally uh, with depressed prices, depressed margins, depressed utilizations of the supply chain asset base. And it's been a very difficult, uh, you know, few years here. I would say, um, <clears throat> you know, with some of the, the trade negotiations uh, that have happened and, and the work that the USTR office did, uh, with the China negotiation and what we're seeing now with the phase one implementation. Um, and there, you see the export notices that, that have been coming out uh, pretty much daily, it seems like, on corn and soybeans and, and some wheat to, to China. The business has picked up dramatically. Um, there's still a lot of headroom to get to the, uh, the goals there, but uh, you know, the, the progress, it's exciting. Um, the industry is uh, you know, much more enthusiastic. 
Um, and frankly, we really needed that uh, in the midst of uh, the COVID pandemic on top of everything else. So I think we've, we've turned the corner a little bit here. Um, I'm cautiously optimistic. Um, there was a comment made early about, uh, earlier about reliance on China, um, and we clearly are uh, pretty reliant on China. Um, and it is a major driver to the enthusiasm that I think we're seeing in our industry right now. And, and I'm optimistic uh, that the continuation of the phase one implementation will be supportive uh, to U.S. agriculture and our Minnesota farmers. Excellent. Thank you, John, very much. Uh, Cheryl, let's hear from you. Yeah, so again, I'm going to um, look from the perspective of the dairy industry. And, and one day's worth of milk production each week depends on trade. Exports, they play an indisputably important role in U.S. dairy. Our market typically teeters on 2 to 3%. Uh, annual growth or otherwise. And so when you think about that 15% is exported, that, that simplifies, it illustrates the importance of that. So to maintain our industry strength and offer opportunities for further growth, uh, we need to expand exports. I wanna make a really important point um, in that cheese markets took a more sustained hit from the retaliatory trade tariffs from Mexico and China, I think 2018 and 2019, than the pandemic's impact to date. So again, it's critically important what goes on. The past five years of trade have been riddled with challenges for U.S. dairy. Again, uh, to repeat, the trade wars, uh, U.S. imposed tariffs, uh, ill-conceived European policies that resulted in a massive stockpile of skim milk powder that suppressed global dairy protein prices through the spring of 2019. So there is, again, many examples of the importance of a, of a healthy trade environment. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Very good. Howard, let's hear from you now. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I think the where we are today with our trade and industry, we talked about that a little bit, and the financial challenges our farmers are facing when we pencil out that 2020 uh, projections, um, you know, last winter, and we can't see any way that, or the farmer can't see a way to, to make money and, and to break even, um, unless they have huge, huge crops, it, 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 just the risk involved with that is, is immense. So we need to continue to expand these markets, um, increase that demand. Perhaps we need to take a look at something uh, on the supply side a little bit too. Uh, it's